Welcome to Launchpad, the unique radio show and podcast that celebrates new book releases and the authors that created them. Now, let's take off with your host, Grace Salmon. This is Launchpad. Welcome to episode 37 with Noel Caraccio, Clifford Gangstan, Garstang, Evelyn Cole Latore, and Elizabeth Sumner Waffler. I am so excited to have these authors from She Writes and Black Rose Writing Press. We're so excited because today we're going to be learning about a sharing of a marriage memoir, evocative women's fiction, dual timelines in paradise, and a long deceased grandmother's quest to solve a family kidnapping. Join us today, fall in love with your next author, find your next book, and on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff and myself, welcome to Launchpad. If you're joining us live, please feel free to hop in, join the comments, ask questions of our authors, and generally enjoy our episode today. We have today Noel Caraccio with her book, Secrets and Revenge, Clifford Garstang with The Last Bird of Paradise, Evelyn Cole Torre with Love in Any Language, a memoir, and Elizabeth Sumner Waffler with A Cleft in the World. Welcome to each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. So excited to have you. Let's just drum, drum right in with Noel. Tell us about Secrets and Revenge. Well, Secrets and Revenge is my fourth novel. It is a sequel to the first one, Secrets Change Everything. And th those two are similar. But I have a second novel, which is called Shattered City, where a dirty bomb goes off in New York City. And what do the survivors do? Are they going to work together to survive or not? The third one is called Stand in the Box, which is the story of an eight-year-old and 12-year-old whose parents die in a car crash. And they name an uncle on each side of the family who are not related by blood or marriage as the co-guardians. And you can imagine what a mess that causes. So Secrets and Revenge... We, I bring back the same characters as the first novel. Um, and uh, Fanny is the long deceased grandmother who is asked to come back from the other side. This is the second time she comes back to help her granddaughter and her husband, whose three month old baby has been kidnapped. <clears throat> They've had no ransom demand, no, no, no communication whatsoever from the kidnapper. And so they turn to Fanny to help them. Now, this genre is called magical realism. So you do have people in this world doing all the normal things that they do, but we have Fanny coming back from the other side. She talks to them. They don't see her, but they hear her. And she's, she's quite a character. She's, she's quirky. She's sarcastic. Um, I would say she's full of life, except that's kind of not true because she's on the other <laughs> side. Um, and, and she's very opinionated, but she is extremely devoted to the family and she wants to help them in any way she can. So um, uh, the, to make matters even more complicated than, than they are, the first time she came back from the other side, she was speaking to her daughter, Abby, and Abby was speaking to her. But this time, Abby's speaking to her and Fanny is not responding to Abby. Abby can't hear her. All, the only person who can hear her is her grandson, Jason, who is freaked out every time Fanny talks to him. Yeah. So, more and more to be unfolded there for sure. Yes. Cliff, Cliff Garstang, tell us about The Last Bird of Paradise. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here and love to talk about the book. Um, one early reviewer described the book as part history, part romance, and part corporate intrigue, which I think is spot on, because in my mind, it's a book about unequal power dynamics in personal, economic, and geopolitical relationships. It takes place mostly in Singapore, where about a century apart, two women have found themselves kind of against their will. Uh, the frame story is the contemporary story, which is about a woman named Ashlyn Givens, who is a rising star in her New York law firm. And in 2002, she and her husband are disillusioned with life in New York City. Um, the atmosphere there to them has become oppressive. And so he takes a job, her husband takes a job in Singapore with an investment bank, and they move. 
and she is feeling resentful. They both get involved in various entanglements that lead to some problems. Um, but the interesting thing is that she acquires three paintings uh, to decorate their apartment with, and she becomes very involved in in these paintings. They actually come alive for her. They speak to her. They tell her the story of the artist. And the story of the artist we see in excerpts from a diary. And the artist is a woman named Elizabeth Pennington, who in 1914 is sent off to uh, Singapore from England, uh, partly for safekeeping at the beginning of World War I, and also because of a scandal she was involved with in, in England. Um, the, the thing that's important about her story is that she is impacted by what happens in Singapore as part of World War I, which is an event that uh, very few people uh, know about, but there is um, a um, <clears throat> rebellion in Singapore that uh, causes all kinds of, of problems. And the two stories are tied through not only the uh, paintings that Elizabeth did, but also through the two women's understanding of the impact of colonialism and exploitation by the Western powers on um, oppressed peoples. So wow. that's the story. A lot of research. <laughs> More to hear about mm -hmm. that as well. And from Singapore to Peru, Evelyn Cole La Torre, tell us about Love in Any Language, a memoir of cross-cultural marriage. Yes, um, this is my second memoir. And um, I had finished writing my first memoir, which is, was about my time in the Peace Corps uh, in Peru and had chapters left over. So that's what started <laughs> this book. <laughs> and uh, this is about what happens when uh, a Peace Corps volunteer returns home after two years in the Andes, pregnant and with a Peruvian husband, which her parents kind of got a hint of through her letters, but uh, they still were surprised. And uh, the husband is, was a university student, knew no English, didn't have a skill, hadn't finished college, and uh, but he loved me very much. And so he changed countries. He had never been out of his country, but he took a chance. And uh, so the second book is about what happens when an immigrant comes to this country and some of the obstacles they face. And the obstacles that the wife faces too, because you're trying to uh, join two cultures. And at the same time, we had a child almost right away. And um, so it, it goes into a lot of trials and tribulations. Um, and it would be for anybody who wants to look at different cultures and uh, marriage and what goes into it. A friend of mine said uh, it shows how a... Uh, shotgun uh, wedding turns into a bulletproof marriage. So oh, like that. Um, that is a great tagline. <laughs> that is a fabulous, fabulous tagline. We do have folks who are joining us um, on air. So thank you for joining us on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff, the author marketing coach and myself. We love being, having folks here on Launchpad. So thank you for your comments and welcome everybody who is joining us. Please feel free to ask questions. And last but not least, Elizabeth Sumner Waffler, not in Singapore, not in Dubai, not in Peru, <laughs> but right here in the United States. And tell in us, Virginia, in my in book. In Virginia. <laughs> tell us about A Cleft in the World. Elizabeth. So A Cleft in the World is the story of Georgie Bricker, a 45-year-old French professor at a small Virginia women's college um, who has agoraphobia, the result of a childhood incident. She hasn't left the campus or the, its uh, tiny town environs in over 20 years. Um, she realizes the irony there because she's teaching her young women students to be game um, changers and gate crashers while she's a prisoner of her own mind. When she learns that the college may be forced to shutter due to financial straits, and there may be a little embezzling going on in there, um, she, I mean, the stakes are like Omaha size, S-T-A-K-E-S, um, 
<laughs> because she is like, where would I go? How could I leave here? Who would I be? So we're even, you know, she's even, it's an identity thing too. Um, but she does everything she can to start bolstering the French department. And meanwhile, they hire a financial consultant from Atlanta, who's the son of an alumna. And when he arrives, Georgie discovers that it's her boyfriend from the eighth grade. They haven't seen each other since then. Um, and she's like, OK, no matter how blue his eyes still are, how cute he looks with gray hair, how handsome he is, I cannot get involved with him and thwart my mission. But that doesn't work out quite so well. So by day, she's faculty liaison to his committee. They were thrown together there. And by night, she's moth to his porch light. <laughs> but Georgie rallies her students, who are a delightful and diverse group of young women. And they come up with a plan that could not only save the college, but also force Georgie out into the larger world um, of emotional freedom and a fulfilling new life. Well, we are all over the map in terms of place and people. So I'd like to go back to uh, Noelle. And you have written four different books. Um, and this one takes place largely in Dubai, I think, there, or Dubai well, is a central character in it. Talk well, about location. Please. It's it takes place here in New York State in Westchester County where I live, mm -hmm. but Fanny finds herself in Dubai, which is a clue to the kidnapper who mm -hmm. happened to have known her son-in-law in a law a prior law firm. He was embezzling money. He was doing black market adoptions and had to flee the country, and her son-in-law and a partner give him. 10 days to get his affairs in order, but for a million dollars. So they're black, they have blackmailed him. So they feel that it's very possible he is the, behind the kidnapping. The reason he's in Dubai is Dubai does not have any extradition to the United States. So I guess what it is, is you write about, I was very taken with what Evelyn said and, and find her very courageous, but you write about what you know. You write about what you know. And being an attorney for, I don't want to tell you how many years, a lot of years, every single one of the stories has something, either courtroom scenes, legal entra um, entrapments, entanglements. Um, so those all play into each one of the stories. But but Dubai is, is somewhat of a character. And it came about because I had a client who was the first one I ever knew who used to do business in Dubai. It sounds like such a layered story. So there are so many um, pieces of plays here, and I, I, I want to get to each of you on the importance of location for your book. But we do have a, a listener who wants to know that um, it sounds like you all have great imaginations. Um, unless you were writing a factual book, did your imagination, did your imagination ever get you into trouble when you were younger? Cliff, let's start with you on that question. <laughs> Um, yeah, probably. I, um, I always wanted to be a writer. And one of the things I did after college to give myself some experience was join the Peace Corps like Evelyn. And, um, I think that that was a function of my imagination carrying me away, literally, uh, 10,000 miles or however far away South Korea is, um, so yeah, that kind of got me into trouble with my father who thought I was throwing away my education by by joining this organization that he didn't quite understand. Okay, uh, Elizabeth, did your imagination ever get you into trouble as a child? Oh, I'm sure everything got me into trouble when I was a child. <laughs> Um, but I did, it was, um, my story, A Cleft in the World, this, this novel was, um, every, has everyone heard of Sweetbriar College in Virginia? Sure. Yeah. I think Cliff is from Virginia, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I had a high Sweet school friend who went there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Sweetbriar almost went under, I guess it's been about 15 years ago now. Oh. And that was my inspiration. Um, for my story, for what I wanted to happen with Georgie. And it, um, 
I went and visited Amherst on the campus for a day and sat and wrote there by the lake and uh, just, you know, immersed myself in the location. I've spent many um, residencies at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts right across the highway from Sweetbriar College. And I was actually in residence the day that Sweetbriar announced that they were going to close. So, nice. Yeah, I've been paying, following that very closely ever since. I got oh, into a lot of, yeah, my imagination got me into big trouble when I was in grade school in this small town in Montana, population 200. And uh, I, I spent the first three chapters of my first book, uh, between Inca Walls, perfecting that story. And what it was is I had a big imagination and saw something or thought I saw something sexual that took place between a boy and a girl. And I went and told the mother because I wanted the girl to be safe. And the next day at school, they said I had made it all up and the whole school ostracized me. It was a very traumatic for, for I think I was 12. But after writing those three chapters, they didn't fit in my book they, because my first book is about being in the Peace Corps. And I do put in my childhood in Montana. But uh, so I'm, I think I'll put those chapters on my website probably because they, they were really perfected, <laughs> but I couldn't That'd put them in great, the book. That would be a great marketing piece. And I'm sure uh, Mary Helen yes. Sheriff uh, would be able to help us with that. Noelle, did yes. your... Did you ever get in trouble because of your imagination when you were young? I'm going to tell maybe just a little bit of the opposite of that. When I was a freshman in college, we did these core courses that were related. It was religion, philosophy, and science or around a core theme. And so for the final project, you were supposed to do something, whatever you wanted. And, and I was really stumped and I didn't know what to do. And everything I came up with sounded boring. So I wrote a piece about set in the distant future about humans who don't have any more legs because they've been in space capsules all these times. <laughs> and and I believe me, I'm not interested in science fiction in the least. And I showed it to a friend of mine. She goes, oh, I don't think you should. I don't think the professors are going to like that. I don't think you should do it. I said, well, it's pretty late now. And I, I submitted it. I said, what the hell? I have to do something. And they really liked it. I got an A in the course. So mine was a little bit of the opposite, but kind of showing that you have to you have to believe in what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Bonnie <laughs> Bell Grenoble Thornton, thank you for that question. I want to go back to the uh, sense of place. Uh, we uh, focused a little bit on uh, the United States and Dubai, and now both Cliff and Elizabeth have talked about parts of Virginia. How important is place? Uh, to both Cliff and Elizabeth. And then, Evelyn, I want to go to you because Peru is a good segue there. Mm -hmm. So, Elizabeth and Cliff, place in your novels. Elizabeth, go ahead. Well, I think everything um, in, in all of my books um, place is almost another character. Um, it, it just, you get immersed in their world and you see it in your mind as you're writing. Um, Right now, and I'm, I'm writing at, right now a um, Christmas romance coming out October 29th with She Writes Press. And it's um, the store. It's set here at the Grand Bohemian Lodge in my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina. So I'm all about, you know, I get to go right at the lodge, spend time at the lodge and getting to know everyone. The staff there has been really helpful and fun. Wonderful. Cliff. Well, places uh, for this book in particular, it's incredibly important. The whole idea of Singapore as a former British colony, as an emerging uh, economic power, it's all related to the themes that I'm exploring. But it's also one of the cities that I know best. I lived there for almost 10 years. With I was a lawyer with a U.S. law firm that had a small office there, and I just came to know it. Uh, extremely well. And when I was writing the book, I went back for three weeks to um, refresh my understanding of the climate and the my senses and the food. And, and also because there's this historical element, I wanted to actually visit some of these 
early 20th century uh, buildings and late 19th century buildings that are still there because they play a big part in the story. So, um, I mean, you can even see from the cover of the book, it's a jungle and that's, that plays an important part of, of the story as mm. well. So it's a gorgeous cover. It is. Thank yeah. you very much. Very much so. Okay. Evelyn from Peru to California, the importance of place. Well, I was going to say in each one of my books, I put a map in the front so you can see where the place is. And I did that for my uh, first book, too, uh, Between Inca Walls. And obviously, being in Peru is a little more exotic than being in Northern California, at least people think. And you have to read the book and you'll find out that Northern California can be just as exciting and adventuresome. But uh, and because I married a Peruvian, we go back periodically to Peru so I can see how things change. But uh, there again, I start off the second book with the flavors of the food and the costume. Well, not costumes. They're there. What people wear there, the different hats that uh, people wear in the different uh, towns. And um, and so especially the uh, roads when I was there in the 60s, uh, the road between Cusco and Abancay, which took eight hours on a bus between and I went many times back and forth uh, was very high up and the Aparimac River runs I think it's 3,000 feet down below and believe you me I saw plenty of cars that would go off of that so the geography has always fascinated me of different places and the different customs and the everything about different cultures but uh, my second book goes into what was happening in the 60s and the riots and the tear gas and all that. So place, yeah, is very important and, and is a character in both my books. Oh, thank you each for those answers. Noelle, one of the things I'm particularly fascinated with this episode is all of you have written multiple books. And as a multiple book author myself, I find that each and every book has changed me and my outlook. Um, this is uh, Secrets and Revenge is your fourth novel. Um, Talk a, maybe a little bit more about that book or how this one has changed you differently than the others. Well, let me, I also, I'm the only one. Let me just at least show you the cover. I haven't done that. So there it is. <laughs> Very um, nice. There it is. Um, I, I, you know, I was an English major in college and I was looking to get a PhD in English and I had a Danforth fellowship. Um, but as I looked around, I could see there were no jobs. There were no, you know, there were not any jobs. And my parents had paid for college, but they weren't going to keep paying. They expected me to go out and work and get a job. So I decided to go to law school. But I can remember being in, in English classes, being in uh, a drama class where I said, geez, I think I could do that. I think I could write. I think I could write something. And it, it lay dormant for many years mm. until about 10 years ago when a friend of mine said something about she wanted to, she wanted to do something. She wanted to write a book about a do her dog. And I said, you know, that kind of piqued me going forward. Um, it, so what I, what I found is um, the very first publisher I had talked about the two kinds of writers, the pantsers and the plotters. And, you know, the, the plotters are the ones who have the whole outline written in advance and the pantsers are the ones who write by the seat of their pants. And if you asked me which I would be based on how I practice law, I would say I would be a plotter. But I have written four novels now as a pantser. OK, and what I see is the character tells me what's going to happen. And I'm surprised at that myself. Um, it is fascinating when that happens. Cliff. You are on two novels, I believe. Actually, it's uh, this is my third novel, and I also published uh, three collections of short stories. Um, and they're all very different. Um, <clears throat> each one has taken a different process. What's unique about this one is that the two main characters from the contemporary story and the historical story, uh, narrative are women. And so writing from the point of view of women allowed me to really think very differently. Uh, it, with previous books, like my last novel was called Oliver's Travels, and there was a lot of me in that character. And um, with these characters, I'm not there. Um, you know, I had to, I really needed to use 
my imagination to um, to get inside the heads of these of these two women, and that was extremely fun and challenging and it's probably why it took me seven years to write the book <laughs> Man. Wow. I, I, I can understand that for sure evelyn how have your book two books changed you well of course writing memoir is, is the biggest reward is that you get to look at yourself if you can look at yourself honestly and the first book i really got had a lot of compassion for what happened to me and a lot of appreciation. I had been raised in a very religious household. And so, of course, coming home pregnant, which I couldn't tell my parents about until the baby was born. And the day the baby was born, my mother said, oh, was he premature? And I said, no, mom. And so you can imagine. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And, and, and then just uh, having a, a caring husband, they got so that he, my husband was very much uh, loved by my family. So, so, but it took time and to, to look at what had happened and my part in it, again, a, a memoir, if you're honest, you have to look at your part. And uh, I appreciated the passion that I had and how I went against some teachings that had been given. And I often say it's the best mistake I ever made because we've been married for 58 years now. Wow. And, and the second one, I, I even had greater appreciation for what my husband, how he had excelled. He started off being a busboy, knew no English. And then ended up with a master's in physics and is, was a computer program uh, programmer. So, so you what, appreciate what people have done and gone what through. Great, what great stories, Elizabeth! Again, not last but not least, it's a <laughs> nature of the voca of the alphabet. Tell us, you've written four different books. How have they changed you? Well, I, ha I just I just thought of something. Um, sure. So I don't have art copies yet, but here is the. Um, what my cover is going to look like oh, nice. oh, cool. Christmas at Reedy Falls, a romance. And what I wanted to say about culture there is that when I discovered that when the lodge opened, the Grand Bohemian Lodge here in Greenville opened, um, it was it's decorated with indigenous, the art of indigenous peoples. Um, and I knew nothing mm -hmm. about Native American culture. And so I've had to do a lot of study, too. Um, and it's so it's a photojournalist um, and a and an up and coming um, photographer. No, excuse me, photojournalist and a journalist who come together to cover the lodge um, at Christmas time. And she has just learned the female lead has just learned that her grandfather was um a Native American, and she had no idea. And she's from south of broad Charleston, and all that implies her mom is a big snob, and uh, she wants nothing, don't wants to be nothing like her mom. Whereas Rob, the male character, is from south of South Boston. So there have these two cultures are coming together, and then all their romance is happening in um, a place filled with Native American. Well, we have lots Art of uh, cross-cultural pieces here from around the world to um, cross-cultural uh, relationships. I could not be more grateful to have each of you on Launchpad, to have everybody who has joined us. Um, our guests say um, congratulations on 58 years of marriage and culture in place are so important. I want to thank um, each of our guests. Hold up your books. We've got Noel. Uh, Sicario, Caraccio, um, Caraccio. I had it right in the whole, you did. Uh, the the whole rest of the episode. <laughs> Secrets and Revenge, one of her four novels. Check out the other three. Um, Cliff Garstang with short stories and this book and another novel and this one, The Last Bird of Paradise. Evelyn uh, Cole Torre with two um, different books and Elizabeth Sumner Waffler, most recently with A Cleft in the World and a wonderful book coming out in October just in time for Christmas. Thanks to everybody who has joined us and thanks to each of you for being here on the launch pad. Thank thanks you, Brian. Thank you. And Evelyn, I'm so impressed with you. <laughs> oh, thank Me you. Too. Well, I'm so, and I'm <laughs> even more impressed that you're still together. I thought you were. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad.